Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Every week, we get lots of great questions from our awesome listeners, and so many have stacked up. It's time for another edition of Ask the Guys, and we'll bring it to you from the great state of South Dakota. Your questions, our answers, today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. As real estate investors, it's no secret that the real estate guys love Florida. And the Sunshine State continues to receive more than its fair share of businesses and population relocating from the Northeast, which has created a huge opportunity for real estate investors. So come join Russ and me in mid-August for our first ever Jacksonville Palm Coast Ocala field trip. On this highly interactive trip, you'll get an up-close, hands-on, personal experience you'd be hard-pressed to find elsewhere. You'll feel the vibrancy of the markets, observe the quality of the infrastructure, and truly get a sense for the demographics, all things you just can't do by simply searching online. Plus, we'll introduce you to our boots on the ground team and you'll meet some amazing investors from all over. To reserve your spot, go to realestateguysradio.com and click events where you'll find the Jacksonville field trip. There's a big difference between researching a market from afar and seeing it with your own eyes. So join the Real Estate Guys, August 12th through 15th, as we explore not one, but three amazing real estate markets. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click events for the Jacksonville Palm Coast Ocala field trip. See you there. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. With me, as usual, it's our co-host, financial strategist, Russell Gray. Hey, Robert. One of our favorite shows is when you ask us questions, and that's today. It's Ask the Guys. Your questions are answers. Folks who want to know more, go to the website at realestateguysradio.com and click Ask the Guys. Tons of great questions today. We're going to get through as many as we can. Only disclaimers are we don't give advice. We are not tax or legal professionals. What we do is give you ideas and information for you to process in any way you see fit. With that, question number one comes from Maggie in Orlando, Florida. We got some good questions today for the financial strategist. Here's one. Should I reinvest the profit from my investment property towards the principal to pay it off faster? If you get positive cash flow and every month that money is coming in, you have to decide what to do with it. We're big proponents of not just spending it, even though that can create a great lifestyle. And for many folks, that's what they're after is a bunch of passive cash flow. But this question specifically, Russ, is do I take that extra money and pay down my mortgage? Yeah, so this is really uh, a question of equity and how you want to approach equity. Equity, in my opinion, is fickle because it's the product of the market and the market goes up, the market goes down, and the market goes down, equity goes away first, debt remains fixed. When you have equity in a property, you're a target for a lot of reasons. It's easy to see through the public record if you have a note recorded against a property and most people can figure out the value of the property, then people know that there's a certain amount of wealth there. If there's a slip and fall or some type of other liability attached directly to the property, even if it's in an entity, that equity is still vulnerable. If for some reason you lose control of your cash flow, if there is a lockdown, if there is an eviction moratorium, not that that would ever happen, but if it did and you ended up losing control of the cash flow, then your equity is in jeopardy. Uh, there's also less incentive for the lender to work with you if there's equity there to make them whole if they foreclose quickly. So let's step back just for a minute. Equity is the part you own, right? You buy a property, you put some money down, you get a loan and it's worth what it's worth and there's not any equity left there except whatever your down payment was. Over time, as you pay down the mortgage and as the house goes up in value, now you've got more equity. Well, if this idea of taking the cash flow and paying down the equity lowers the amount of what's owed against it, the loan, which it does, therefore it increases the equity. So imagine this, Russ has a house worth $100,000 and uh, he keeps pulling the equity out when he can, repositioning it. Now the house is worth $150,000, but he owes like one forty eight against it. He's not a target. Nobody's going after Russ. In fact, the lender's gonna work with him if he has a problem. If I, on the other hand, have that same house and I diligently pay it down, pay it off, in fact, now I own it outright, it's worth $150,000. That's $150,000 of exposed equity. Now someone's looking for a reason to come after me. Yeah, and the second, so the first consideration we discuss is really asset protection, the protecting the equity, that's number one. The second consideration is liquidity. Because once you put the equity into the property and you're paying it down, the only way to get back out is either to sell the property or qualify for another loan, presuming that you can qualify, presuming that the lending environment is offering money at a reasonable price. 
So it's an extremely illiquid way to store wealth on your balance sheet. So you've got the asset protection concern and you've got the liquidity concern. Well, and additionally, think about it this way. You have to qualify to borrow money. The bank or the lender is going to look at your income and your history and your credit and all those things. And you have to apply and pay points typically to borrow money. So when you pay money back, you pay your loan down. It's as though you're saying, here, Mr. Lender, here's $100 back. If I need it back again, I'm going to have to requalify and pay you more points and fees. So if your plan is to use debt in real estate in the future, why on earth would you want to pay it off? Exactly. And that goes back to the third argument now, which is the yield or the growth, the return, if you will, on the equity. I call it the equity growth rate. And if you think of it this way, just very simply, if you put 20% uh, down on a $100,000 property, it's $20,000. The property value is $100,000, you have an $80,000 loan. Yep. If the property goes up 5%, that's $5,000 of equity growth, and that's all yours. So you get $5,000 of equity growth on only $20,000 of purchase equity or down payment that you put in. That's a 25% equity growth rate because you hold the property at five to one leverage. You have 20% of your equity, which is one fifth, and you have four fifths, 80,000, which is the debt that makes up the five-fifths of, of owning the property. That's five to one. So the way you figure out what your equity growth rate is, is your ratio, in this case, five times the, the actual appreciation, which is 5%. So five times 5% is 25%. Well, think about it if you owned 50% down. Now you're at a two to one leverage ratio because you diligently pay down. If that property goes up $5,000, 100,000 to 105, 5% appreciation, 5,000 of new equity on your $50,000 of equity you have in the property, your equity growth rate is now two times five, only 10, less than half. And that's because you've lost the benefit of leverage. From a financial perspective, you would be better off taking that money and making a down payment on a second property, adding more debt. And so when you know how to calculate the equity growth rate, you realize that you want to have more debt on the property as long as you can control it reasonably by cash flow. And then it comes to this next thing. You, see, you may say, well, it's not a good time to buy real estate. It may not be a good time to buy real estate if you have been in an appreciating market and it's gone from being low to high in terms of its equity growth because of supply and demand and the demographics, meaning the migration and the uh, debt to income ratios of the particular community or the rent to value ratios of a particular community. Okay, so markets do get to a point where they're, they're overheated. So I wouldn't necessarily pull equity out of a property and make a down payment in another overheated market. But here's the thing about real estate. It's not a market and it's not an asset class. Right. And so you can literally move money from a appreciated market into an emerging market where that hasn't happened yet. For example, if you're in California or Seattle and you've got a lot of equity and those markets are losing people for whatever reasons, you know, and you can talk about what those reasons are, but it doesn't matter. If you just look it up, it's happening. And the three fastest growing states are Idaho, Nevada, and Arizona right now. Why? Because the West Coast is hemorrhaging people equity and incomes and people are moving into these other states. So while property prices are experiencing more downward pressure in some of these places where people are vacating, you have a lot of upward pressure in some of these markets where people are going. And when you see that, you go, well, I can get in on that simply by moving equity into those emerging growth markets. Or you look at a market like we're active in Belize. And in Belize, there is no financing. Well, at some point in time, there will be, that's probable because debt has to expand in our global economy. And we saw this happen before, right before the mortgage crisis, they, they ran out of places to lend in the United States and they were looking at Mexico. They were going to do lending in Mexico. And they did. And they did. And when you introduce financing into anything, look at college loans, you introduce financing into the college loans to make it more affordable. It made college education more expensive because you brought the future purchasing power or the future dollars into the present by borrowing. Right. That's what debt is. You take the future money and put, bring it into the present. Well, when you're in a real estate market that doesn't have debt yet and you think that it will come, you can take your equity from a property that does have debt in a market that's heated and move it into a market that doesn't and then ride that wave when that debt comes. So there's a lot of strategic reasons. And the final argument is that right now in an environment where you can borrow at three to four percent, if you leave your equity in the property, 
What you are saying is that I cannot find an investment at more than three to four percent. Forget all the other stuff we talked about, right? right. The asset protection, the, you know, all that stuff. Forget that. Just say, is this the best investment I could make? If you're going to prepay that loan or pay it down, you're actually making deposits into a savings account, if you will, that you have to qualify to make withdrawals from that could go down in value at any time. Your principal is not guaranteed. And you're only getting three to 4% yield. And yet you know that then in real estate, you can make investments as high as 20, 25%. So I, I see no compelling reason to do it. I see lots of compelling reasons not to do it. So there you go, Maggie. Those are our thoughts. Question number two comes from Kuho in Poughkeepsie, New York. Hi, thank you for taking my question. I have a single family house with a bad tenant who has a bad history of not paying the rent here in Poughkeepsie. It's a four bedroom house with four bathrooms built by Toll Brothers in 2007. Yes, I bought it during the top of the bubble market. Past couple of years, the property value has gone up about 30%, even though the tenant has not paid me since the beginning of the pandemic. I'm debating whether I should sell the house after I evict the tenant when the rules ease, hopefully this fall, or should I hold on to it and try to rent it out again? Thanks again, Q. All right, Q, well, loved your work in James Bond. Hey, <laughs> uh, I, I think this is also very much about your personal investment philosophy. It's, if it's a great market and a great property, that's independent from this particular tenant. Uh, many times I see real estate investors get caught up in the fact that they don't like to have tenants based on one bad tenant. Having had thousands of tenants, there's great tenants. Most of the tenants are good tenants. Every now and then you get a bad apple, but the eviction moratoriums have made it even more difficult because of that. So now you've got this house, it's gone up in value. It basically has no cash flow, even though the tenant is accruing owing you this rent who knows what's going to happen in the state of new york frankly it's a very tenant friendly state so russ what are your thoughts i think anytime you look at an investment anywhere and circumstances change because that's what's happened you have to ask yourself knowing what i know now and I, if i could go back or if i was on the market right now and i was shopping around for a property to buy would I buy this property? Knowing what I know now, knowing what I know now about the political climate, the regulatory climate, now that I know what I know about the economic climate, the lending climate, and the landlord law, now that I know what I know about the neighborhood, and then compared to what? A lot of times you get trapped in properties. That's one of the considerations in real estate. You know, you should never get into an investment if you don't have an exit. And you should always have multiple exit strategies, at least two. And you should have them in your mind so that you can recognize which path is the best way to go when circumstances change. And if you have your eyes to the horizon and you see these troubles coming, a lot of times you can get to the exit before people who are asleep at the wheel. So this is a tough decision because you don't have the ability necessarily to get the tenant out. I'm not familiar with the eviction laws or the moratorium laws, especially in the state of New York, because that's not a state I would ever consider investing in personally. But if you have the ability to get rid of the tenant, if you sell the house, do you have the option to sell the house? As a landlord operating it as a, as a rental property, you may not have the ability to evict the tenant. I would check with a real estate attorney to find out if you were actually to sell the house, list the house, could you evict the tenant under those circumstances? And you may be able to exit the property. Or you may be able to exit the property, as you say, when eventually you can evict the tenant. But the big question there is, what do I do with this property? So it also comes down to what we talked about earlier. What's the debt and the equity? What does that look like? What would your return on equity be based on what a new good tenant would be paying you? And if it makes sense to keep the investment, keep the investment. If on the other hand, you could reposition all of that equity, whatever your proceeds are after you sell, after your costs, into a market that made better sense, into a more landlord-friendly environment, those are things to consider. Absolutely. I mean, you know, Brad Sumrock, we call him the apartment king. And one of the things he teaches his students in the due diligence process is to underwrite the market. Yeah. And he's got a checklist of things that he looks for. And top of the list is, is this a business friendly? Is this a landlord friendly state? And some of that is about their tax policies. Are they attracting people? Uh, right now, people are feeling the pressure of taxes and the, the threat of additional taxes. And the migration patterns show that people are favoring moving to states with lower taxes. Some states are waking up and actually passing laws to try to lower their taxes and become more competitive. And that's what happens when there is a degree of scarcity in the market, right? People start to compete. States start to compete. 
And so one of the dangers in real estate that everybody has is they often just think about real estate in terms of the local market that they live in, that they know, and they don't really realize. And I remember being one of those people before I met you, Robert, it was like, it never occurred to me that I could buy real estate out of my area, much less out of the country right? because I just had a small world view. And I didn't understand these macro factors, but over the last 20 years, I've learned that nothing is foreign. It's only foreign to you because the people who live in wherever it is, that's home to them. And if you can just get connected to people and teams in these markets that know these markets like the back of their hands because it's their home, but the macro factors are more supportive of investment, then you can really have the best of both worlds. So my first thing is I would really rethink the idea of being an investor in New York compared to other places you could invest. And then you gotta look at this particular property, this particular circumstance and ask yourself, has this market, has this neighborhood run its course? And would it be wise for me to exit? Then you would explore, can I even get out and how and when? Uh, and then during the period of time where you're doing all of that, then you can be shopping around for other markets. We're gonna be doing a field trip in just a couple of weeks to Jacksonville, Florida and that northern area of Florida. Florida has been one of the hottest states for net in migration, for businesses, for population. Uh, it's still extremely affordable, no income tax. The weather is fantastic. And one of the things people learned in COVID is you don't have to live in cold weather, high density, high tax, expensive places if you can do your work from anywhere. Right. And so we're back in the field trip game because there's so many interesting things happening the markets have really shown some divergence, if you will. And so to compare and contrast, and so if, if you're so inclined, I'd invite anybody listening to this, come on a field trip, watch the way we look at a market. When we go into a market, we work with the local team, we look at the drivers, we look at the macro picture, we go around, we look at the neighborhoods, we look at the infrastructure, we get a feel for the vibe, the demographic. You may or may not be interested in that particular market, but at least you learn the technique of how do you go into an area that you're not familiar with and quickly become familiar and make it home to you. And that's a big compared to what anyway, Q, is you're trying to decide, does this make sense to keep? You have to do the compared to what and looking around makes sense. In fact, we're here in South Dakota looking around. Uh, the real estate guys put their money where their mouth is. We're traveling the globe this summer looking for real estate opportunity. It's Ask the Guys, your questions, our answers. We've got lots more when we come back. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Live nationwide, you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. For thousands of years of human history, silver has been recognized as money. Then in 1965, the United States took silver out of the financial system. But did silver stop being money? Smart investors don't think so. And ever since, when there are concerns about the quality of the currency, alert investors seek shelter in silver and gold. As the size and frequency of major financial crises grow, silver is attracting a lot of attention. To help better understand the what, why, and how of silver, watch the free nine-part series, Making Sense of Silver, everything you always wanted to know about silver but didn't know to ask, featuring 30-year precious metals veteran Dana Samuelson. Send your email request to silverseries at realestateguysradio.com. Whether you own silver now or you're wondering if it's too late, email silverseries at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, this is Chris Martinson, author of Prosper, and you are listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program in South Dakota this week. We are traversing the globe uh, this summer. We have been to Belize and Arizona and now South Dakota. We got more stops. Before you know it, we're going to be in the great state of Florida. It's The Real Estate Guys summer tour, but it also lets us uh, address all kinds of stuff in all kinds of places. We're talking today with uh, our listeners via email, so it's Ask the Guys. If you have a question for the guys, just go to the website at realestateguysradio.com and click Ask the Guys. Question three comes from Emma in Tupelo, Mississippi. Hi, guys. I've been listening to your friend Robert Kiyosaki, and I had the idea of buying land and building rentals like duplexes, and I wanted to get your feedback if this is a smart investment. 
I've already formed an LLC and plan to open a line of credit for my business, but this would be my first real estate investment. All right, Emma. Well, first of all, uh, congratulations for hanging out and listening to our friend Robert Kiyosaki. He's a smart dude. He's uh, certainly changed our thinking about a lot of things. Uh, let's talk about your first investment. Is buying land and figuring out how to build something a good first investment? My short answer is no. Yeah, it really depends on your experience, your expertise, and your ability to assemble a team. Real estate investing at any level is a team sport. And development is a little bit more risky because you're purchasing something that doesn't exist. You're assuming a lot of things. The conditions at which you bring your product to market are gonna be basically the same or better than the conditions at which you undertook the project and your ability to get from raw dirt to the certificate of occupancy and the ability to either sell to the retail market, the investment market, or to generate rental income. And so you really do need to know what you're doing. So again, quoting Robert Kiyosaki, there's no good or bad investment. There's just smart or dumb investors. And dumb is not meant to be derogatory. It's just a concept of, are you really qualified to do this type of a deal? I think, you know, Robert said, the short answer is no, because he's in the development business and he understands how difficult it is, although we wouldn't discourage you if you have the right supporting cast. So that, to, in my mind, that's really what it comes down to. We've got a couple of investors we know that have spent years in the trades, general contractors working as subcontractors. They have the relationships and the knowledge to build something profitably. Add to that today that the fact that all the components of construction are double, triple, quadruple the price they normally are, it's gonna make that hard to pencil. Now, if you buy the right land in the right place, you buy enough of it, you subdivide, you create value there, you force equity, you bring in utilities and entitle, all of that is what we do. We hardly ever talk about it on the show because this show is not about Russ and I, but I will say that as a first investment, if this is your first real estate investment, so much easier to buy something that's already built, that has a history of rental income, that has a known tenant landlord environment, that has professional management and team members available. I think there's a lot of hair on development, even when you've been in the business for 10 years. So I just don't usually suggest it as a first investment with one big exception. And that is, if you decide to passively invest, with a great storied, experienced developer. Many times developers raise money through something called a private placement, a syndication, and you can come alongside a developer and invest in a project without having to do all the work yourself. Yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't do it without at least a mentor somebody that's really committed, that has got a proven track record, that really knows what they're doing, not somebody that wrote a book or somebody that's telling a story, but somebody that actually is doing it in the real world right now. And the reason that's important is because we're in a very interesting economic environment and it's called inflation. And so when you're trying to project out what your costs are gonna look like or what absorption is gonna look like from a standpoint of will people's income really match the rents that you need to have the project make sense or to have an investor make sense, uh, there's a lot of variables. I mean, just look at what's happened to the price of lumber, but it's not just lumber, it's copper, it's concrete, the costs of labor. We work with people in that space and we know that they start out putting a project together. We have a, a, some friends of ours that just aborted a development project because when they looked at all the numbers, when they, when they first entered into the idea that they wanted to do the project, the numbers penciled. But now because of that changing dynamic, they can't do the deal. The numbers no longer pencil. If you don't have the skill and the experience and the connections to understand the supply chain, the labor pool, and to look at it and, and to project forward, is this a go or no go decision, uh, then you need to be aligned with a mentor or specifically to Robert's point, you can ride shotgun with an experienced, proven, successful developer in this environment. And that's, again, another challenge because a lot of people haven't seen this type of environment. Even somebody that's got a proven track record in the environment we've been in, this is a brand new world. So it's a, it's a very dangerous place to be your very first investment. Don't want to, again, discourage you if you've got the right supporting cast, but I'd say probably by and large, you'd probably be safer doing something a little bit more already established where the absorption is there, the numbers are there, and you get your mind around what it takes to run a project, just even just acquiring an income producing property that already exists. Yeah, timing you mentioned, Russ, and this is critical. It takes time to develop a project. You have to get approvals, you have to have plans drawn and all those things. Imagine this, you're in a marketplace and everybody can see that we need more housing and 80 or 90 or 100 different people are working on it, fast forward three years, it's overbuilt. So there's just, the point is there's so much to development. 
I love it. I would not discourage you from getting your mind around it. It was not my first investment. It was not my hundredth investment. So eventually, the idea of taking dirt and turning it into dollars, love it. But to start, get your legs under you. Get some experience and that will guide you. It's Ask the Guys. Your questions are answers. This question, kind of a long one, comes from Robin in Bozeman, Montana. Just discovered your show last week and I love it. Thank you for the content. I'm looking to find financing for $1.4 million property. It's 20 acres with two rentals on it, as well as a quadrant of unimproved land that I can wholesale into four lots, a minor subdivision. In fact, I've already had it approved by the county and a larger 12 acre portion on the east of it that I'd like to keep as a personal home site after I sell off the minor portion. I'd also like to convert the two rentals into boutique vacation rentals with proceeds from selling the minor portion in two to three years. Subdividing, improving, and selling the four minor lots would pay entirely for the 20 acres and would still leave me the two rentals and the other home site for my family. Anyway, I'm the owner and operator of a lucrative vacation rental and a realtor, but I don't know if I'll qualify for credit. I only show income for the Airbnb rental and a handful of deals I've closed in the last two years. I haven't applied for credit since 2006 and all our properties are financed in my husband's name because I just started claiming income in the last year or two. I've just been raising babies for eight years while working as much as possible around my family. How do you suggest I get qualified for credit? Does my husband need to be on all the deals? I want to be able to qualify independently. I don't even know if I have a credit score. My husband doesn't work in real estate, so when I find good deals, he checks my numbers and we go for it, but I don't like being dependent on him for the financing on my own deals. Not that we aren't doing it together, but need to know how to get credit so that I don't have to send him to my lender every time. Do you offer private financing programs that I could apply for? Thank you so much for your time reading this. Well, thank you, Robin. And a couple of things here. I'll, I'll address the first one, then we'll get to the financial strategist on the loan part. But the first thing, this is a complicated deal no matter what. You got A, credit, and you've got a, a history, and still it's a complicated deal because you're talking about subdividing, construction, changing the use. So there's a lot to get your mind around there. And it harkens back to our last question. Would this be a good first investment? Probably not. Now, Robin, you're a realtor, so you understand the business. You've own property, so I understand that. Uh, again, not discouraging, but there's so many moving parts. So what does a lender do? A lender loans money and they're interested in two things. Number one, how are you gonna pay them back? Number two, what happens if you don't? Here's the, where this gets messy, is the how are you gonna pay them back? You have a history with, it sounds like, a single Airbnb rental. Okay, a lender might give you some credit for that, but frankly, not a lot. And you wanna turn these existing rentals into boutique Airbnb rentals. Now that's a change of use. This is a complicated deal. Add to that the part that you haven't really had the documentable income necessary. Doesn't mean there's not financing available, but we're gonna really need to work through this. Well, so it's, it's really interesting. First of all, congratulations that you're thinking creatively. You see opportunity, that you have a plan. And that's fantastic. Obviously, you're out there in the world and you're finding deals and that's worth a ton. So you're bringing gobs of value. Whether you have the total package and the ability to pull it off on your own, which is implied in all of your questions, like how do I really get this done? There's kind of a progression you need to go through. And it's gonna start with just understanding what is really credit. Credit is two things. Credit is credit, meaning your credit score, your documentable income, your balance sheet, right? The other part of it is your credibility, which is what is your track record? What is your experience? What is your team? This goes harkens back to the comments we had before is on a project like this, you're going to want to make sure for your own safety and benefit, but also for anybody extending you credit or any equity partners that you bring on, that you're going to want to have a great team that is going to give you the technical support that you're going to need to navigate all of these moving parts. And if you've been out there having children, you have a primary responsibility to your family and you can't let this project become your new baby because what will happen is you'll end up neglecting your family. So there's a lot of things to think about in that regard. To really talk about the concept of figuring out your credit score and what your documentable income is, and when you go for what we'd call conventional financing, institutional financing, uh, then you're going to need to work with a mortgage professional. So one of the things that has been my pet project now for a little while is I'm working with developing a financial strategy team spearheaded by lenders, but also tax professionals that work hand in hand together and do consultations with people like you for this exact reason, because people work really hard to drive their taxes down and then they're not documentable in terms of being able to qualify for a loan. What people in real estate have done since forever 
And when I was in the mortgage business personally way back in the day, I saw this happen as the first piece of advice I always gave people because investors typically will go out and they'll find the deal and then go look for the financing. That's backwards. What you do is you go work on your financing and your borrowability and making sure you really understand what you have to work with from a credit profile perspective. And you do that proactively. And then based on your combined purchasing power of your available capital for a down payment and cash reserves and your, your income and your ability to borrow, now you go out in the marketplace and you look for a deal you can do. Now, in this case, you may find out, hey, I can't do this. I can't qualify on my own or I need my husband. Okay, that's great. You may decide that even together you can't do it or you don't want to take all that risk on your own because they may ask for personal guarantees. This is where syndication, which is something we talk about all the time, comes in. You find people that would like to be a part of the project and you can bring them in on the debt side or you can bring them in on the equity side. So if you bring them on the equity side, then they just become capital investors. They put down payment in, they put capital up for CapEx, whatever you need to do. And then on the debt side, they can help qualify for the loan or you can have people who actually invest to be the, the lenders themselves, private lending. Now, to do that, you have to have an ecosystem. You have to have a network. We have our investor registry. And if you go to realestateguysradio.com and look under the resources tab, you will see the investor registry. And you can put into the investor registry what you're interested in, but we have people who have already done that. So if you have an offering, we have a deal desk and you can put that in there and then we can put that out. So there's ways to communicate. You should join investment clubs. You should get involved with your local community. You should get connected to other investors. But I would start with getting a consultation with a mortgage professional. So we have under the resources tab at realestateguysradio.com, uh, under the provider network, you will find commercial lenders and the strategy teams, and you can engage with those folks and you can do a consultation and they can help you go down the process of figuring out how lendable you are or what changes you need to make to become lendable or who you need to bring to the party in order to become lendable. So there's work you need to do on the front end, not about the deal, but about you as the borrower and what kind of a profile do you need to have in order to attract either equity or debt or both. And once you have that profile figured out, then you look at the property because this is a complex property. It may be a little more challenging, but you will be able to find someone who will make you a loan. There's private lenders, there's hard money lenders. There's all kinds of ways to get money for deals. You just have to be clear in your exit strategy and what's in it for them. One thing you may consider is attending our Secrets of Successful Syndication event. We have a lot of people who come to that event, typically a couple hundred people. They're active investors, they have capital, but they're syndicators, they're raising money. Some of them are looking for deals. If you're bringing a deal, it's a great place to network. Now, it's not a place you pitch your deal, but it's a place you build relationships, but you will also learn how to organize a business so that you can raise capital from your own network if in fact you have a deal that makes sense and so you learn about that so if you're interested in learning more about that just send an email to syndication at realestateguysradio.com syndication at realestateguysradio.com we'll get information but that's coming up in september thanks robin more questions and our answers when we come back plus we're going to ask you a question as we play real estate trivia next you're tuned to the real estate guys radio program in south dakota this week i'm your host robert helms Real estate investment advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. In uncertain times like this, it's great to know there are two things you can always count on. High demand for affordable single-family homes to live in and Terry Kerr's amazing Memphis team at Mid-South Home Buyers to find, fix, and manage the next addition to your recession-resistant real estate portfolio. The Memphis market is logistics and distribution dynamo with an economic engine that's essential to moving goods and critical supplies all over the United States quality rehab, proven profitable property management, affordable rents, and solid ROI make turnkey property investing through Terry's team a dream when it matters most. To learn more about Memphis and Mid-South Home Buyers, send an email to midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. That's midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. Hey, ever wished you could go back in time and do some tax planning? Now you can, just like Marty McFly. Lucky for you, a brand new federal law just made this possible with an EQRP to get tax deductions and reduce your taxable income from last year so you can use that tax savings to invest in real estate, Bitcoin, gold, even your own business. Whether you're a full-time investor, doctor, government employee, 
even if you have five or 50 employees, the EQRP works and is your secret weapon. And now it's retroactive. Hey, I'm Damian Lupo and we have your solution. By the way, if you got bad advice and used an IRA for an apartment syndication, you are sitting on a U-bit time bomb. But don't worry, there's a solution, the EQRP. The EQRP company is ready to help you get control of your money, kill U-bit, and help you pay way less taxes. Want to learn more about this strategy? Send an email to EQRP at realestateguysradio.com for my special EQRP report. Paying tax or letting Wall Street suck you dry is dumb. Your first step is freeing your retirement money by sending an email to EQRP at realestateguysradio.com today. Hi, this is Steve Forbes. You're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Have fun. You'll learn something. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks so much for tuning into the show. Hey, join The Real Estate Guys as we check out Jacksonville, Florida for our upcoming field trip. We'll learn all kinds of things about the market, meet potential team members, see properties, even new property under construction. It all takes place the second weekend of August. You'll get the details on the website at realestateguysradio.com under events. It's Ask the Guys. Your questions are answers. Before we get back to the questions, it's time for us to ask you a question as we play our weekly round of real estate trivia. In just a minute, I'll give you a trivia question, and your job will be to figure out the answer. As soon as you think you know it, just send us your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name, your mailing address, and your best guess. The first person that gets it right gets an awesome book called Success Habits of Super Achievers, a collection of incredible stories by some famous people you know and some awesome people you don't. That can be yours if you know today's real estate trivia question. The last two weeks, we brought you highlights from our Investor Summit and had no trivia. But before that, here was our most recent trivia question. The largest college by undergraduate enrollment is located in the state of Florida. Name it. Well, it is, of course, the University of Central Florida. You'll learn lots about Florida if you join us on the Florida field trip coming up. Here's our real estate trivia question for this week. Name the only U.S. state whose name can be typed on just one row of keys on your computer keyboard. Yeah, there's only one state that you can type out its whole name without changing lines. If you know which state that is or just want to quickly guess, send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. The first person that gets it right gets a copy of Success Habits of Super Achievers. That's today's real estate trivia question. It's Ask the Guys coming to you from the beautiful state of South Dakota this week. Uh, this question comes from Nicholas. He's from Bloomington, Indiana. Hi, guys. My name's Nicholas. I'm 20 years old. I'm a finance student and aspiring real estate entrepreneur. I'm currently working to put together an entry-level deal on a duplex, and I'm using your show and resources as a guide for best practices. I'm quickly discovering the legal complexities behind syndication and was wondering what limitations exist on deals like this when you don't have a real estate broker's license. Thanks, Nicholas. Well, Nicholas, first of all, congratulations for getting interested in investment real estate at your young age. I wish I hadn't waited until I was 24 to buy my first property. Here's the reality. There's a lot of great things about real estate syndication. We were just talking about that before the break. It's one of the keys to our personal investment. It's a big part of what we do is educate syndicators and all of that. And so we're, we're big fans of it. One of the challenges though, is the methodology behind syndication can be a little burdensome from a cost and time perspective on a small deal like a duplex. So there's a lot to learn and, and we were certainly big fans of learning and our whole motto, education for effective action. But as you're discovering, if you're thinking about buying a small property and raising money to do it, there are some limitations. Yeah. So first of all, if you're acting as a principal, you don't need to have a real estate broker's license. Okay. And I am not a lawyer, so you can check it with a real estate attorney, but that's been my understanding since forever. And I'm sure when you check with the counsel, you're going to find out that that's accurate, but uh, make sure that you do, but you shouldn't need a broker's license to do the deal. That's In number fact, one. I would argue that they, it's more difficult when you have a broker's license, not hard, but there's more to it because you have to disclose if you're earning a commission that has to be fully disclosed in writing, all those things. So often, Often. I, I was licensed for 18 years and no longer am because I don't do anything that requires a real estate license. I found it better and safer to not be licensed. So don't worry about that part. As Russ says, you're good. Yeah. And then the next part is in a simple syndication, basically, you, you know, any capital stack in any deal, small or large, is very simple. It is down payment and it is debt. 
Yep. Uh, and so you have to decide what are you bringing to the table? Do you have the cash? If you don't, then you're going to need an equity partner. If you need debt, then are you lendable? So the first thing I would do is get in touch with a mortgage professional and uh, you can check out the resources that we have in that regard at, in our provider network under realestateguysradio.com under the resources tab uh, and then find out how lendable you are. If you uh, are lendable, then you are bringing something to the party. In fact, you could argue you're bringing a lot to the party because you're bringing the deal and you're bringing the debt. What you need is a capital partner, somebody who's going to make the down payment. Well, that's just a basic equity share. You find one or two partners that are willing to do it and you can put them on title, have them be principals in the deal. Now it's not a security. At least it largely wouldn't be considered a security. You have to be careful. So if you listen to some of our shows on syndication, in fact, I believe we have a whole series of podcasts on syndication. We call it our Ultimate Syndication Podcast Collection. If you send an email to ultimate at realestateguysradio.com, you can get that. And in that, you'll hear from a gentleman, Mauricio Rould, who has been our syndication attorney in, in our ecosystem since forever. Uh, and he's a great guy. He's a great teacher. He speaks at Secrets of Successful Syndication. Indication, and he will really define whether or not something is a security. If, in fact, whatever you are offering is defined as a security, it gets very complicated. If you are just simply putting together an equity share, something that Robert and his late father, Bob, uh, used to teach people how to do, it's actually pretty simple. It's just a borrower and a down payment, two people on the title, and they have an agreement that somewhere down the road they're going to exit. And what the terms of that exit is, Robert, you can probably fill in the gaps there. Well, we have a good friend, just to give you a, a tangible anecdote about this, who got to the point where he was Fannie and Freddie'd out, meaning he had enough single family home loans he couldn't get anymore, and he had good income. But he got the real estate bug and he worked in a business where there were a lot of folks who were W-2 employees, ease in the cash flow quadrant. So his whole plan was to go into a marketing new well, find houses that he would have bought on his own could he have gotten the loans and instead partnered. Every deal was a partnership with one person. That one partner put up half the money and he put up half the money. That one partner qualified for the loan because that's what he was missing. And what he did was find the deal, vet the deal, go out and get the deal under contract. And then they basically split the upside. They split the positive cash flow. And five or seven years down the road when they sold the property, they split the upside there. Not a syndication, not a security, a simple transaction. So I would say the big picture is rather than trying to teach the whole thing and our short time together today is to just understand, Nicholas, don't complicate the deal. It could be as simple as finding a single partner to do a deal like this together. If you're interested in putting together bigger deals, then definitely come on out to the Secrets of Successful Syndication. Not only will you get the education and hear from a whole bunch of great faculty members, you'll meet extraordinary people. It's Ask the Guys, your questions, our answers. If you have a question for the Real Estate Guys, just go to the website at realestateguysradio.com and click Ask the Guys. This question, actually we have two questions here, Russ, that are kind of related. I'm going to read them both and then we'll toss the ball to you because this is right in your wheelhouse. You're really trusting my short-term memory here, but uh, I'll do the best <laughs> I can to retain both questions in my mind. All right, the first is from Mike in Seattle, Washington. Hi, Robert and Russ. I absolutely love your show and look forward to each new week's episode. By the way, when you start with a nice compliment, you're more likely to get your question on the air. Uh, somehow you guys caused me to step back and look at the big picture just about every week. Well, thanks for those kind words, Mike. We've all heard the saying, cash is trash from Robert Kiyosaki. We've also heard that it's wise to keep plenty of dry powder. How do you recommend a wise investor balance these two maxims? So on one hand, we don't like to hold on to cash. On the other hand, we want to have some available. Okay, you got that one? Here's uh, question number two from our friend Maheen in Santa Ana, California. He says, hey guys, with all this uncertainty in the world, I'm a little fearful of the inevitable bail-in from the banks. We're always told to keep dry powder ready for future opportunities. Is there another institution where one could safely store some easy to deploy currency? Note that I did not say money. Good job, Maheen. All right, not exactly the same question, but since we're talking about dry powder, first of all, let's take Mike's question, and that is how do you balance cash is trash and the thinking behind that, and we got to have some dry powder? Well, I think the cash is trash is really saying the dollar is falling. In fact, all currencies are falling or inflating. Uh, meaning that they're losing purchasing power. That's where equity comes from. 
the house doesn't change because it's become more valuable or it becomes better. In fact, it actually deteriorates, which is why you get a depreciation credit. But the purchasing power to buy the property in terms of the currency, which is falling in purchasing power, it takes more of those dollars. Of course, you fixed your price with your debt and then you get the equity, which is the difference between the dollar denominated value and the dollar denominated debt. So the idea of cash is trash is is built around that idea of currencies losing purchasing power. So that's number one. If I just put together a big pile of dollars and, and stuff it in my mattress, every day it'll buy less. True probably right now more than any time in the last Well, you know, it's years. interesting you say that, Robert, because we talk about that all the time as a way to illustrate the difference between money and currency. If I take a roll of 1964 silver quarters and I put them in my sock drawer and I put a $10 bill or a $10 roll of 1965 quarters in my sock drawer and I wake up 50 years later, I can still go buy 40 gallons of gas with the silver. I just have to convert it into dollars by selling the silver for dollars, whereas the dollars itself will only buy me four gallons of gas. And so you can see that you lost your purchasing power over time when you held dollars instead of silver. That's cash is trash. That's cash is trash. That's number one. Number two is the concept of uh, dry powder. Dry powder refers to liquidity. And I see mistakes that people make in that. One is if they keep their liquidity in dollars in the bank, they're taking both inflation risk, lost purchasing power, and counterparty risk with the bail-in. So those are legitimate fears, right? Nobody looks at a bank's balance sheet these days and underwrites it because we just all rely on FDIC insurance. And so maybe if you're talking about $250,000 or less in a given bank account, you say, okay, well, I'm, I'm willing to take that risk because I know the FDIC is going to come in and make me whole. I'm, I'm taking the inflation risk, but not at least the principal risk in terms of the dollars. Okay. If you have more than that, now you have to think outside that box. And keep in mind, the reason you want dry powder is so if you find a good deal, you can do something. We're not saying sit on tons of cash. What we're saying is that the market changes and it's always good to have some liquidity for any possible circumstance that may arise. But you do have to balance it. For me, the mentality of cash is trash is I, I treat cash as a hot potato. When it comes in, I'm like, okay, awesome. Now let's deploy it somewhere where it will do better than inflation, where we'll make a return, where we'll get tax benefits, where we'll get a, a piece of property somewhere that we're gonna love and enjoy and appreciate or is gonna provide cash flow and all those things. So it's, it's a mentality. The, the actual part of keeping the money, you decide for yourself how much liquidity you need. And liquidity doesn't mean stacks of dollar bills in your safe. Now, stacks of dollar bills in your safe don't have the same counterparty risk that a bank account does. You just have to weigh that. But there are other forms of liquidity. Yeah. So you were talking about having, you're always going to have cash reserves. You want as much of your cash working as possible or as much of your equity or wealth working as possible. But you do have to have liquidity. Sometimes you can get both. You can have something that's working and is also liquid. Now, some people like to use lines of credit. And we just recently heard Wells Fargo just arbitrarily went and shut down lines of credit. Uh, I, you know, people like to use HELOCs to have a form of liquidity. I can write a Home check. Home equity lines of credit. Yes. And I can write a check against my equity at any particular time. The problem is those loans are typically adjustable rate. They're short term. They can be called or shut off. And even if you haven't drawn the line of credit, if you've qualified for it, it counts against your debt to income ratios. And so you have to be cognizant of all that. One of the big mistakes that I made in 2008, I was, I was very dependent on credit lines for my liquidity. And when the credit crisis came, it wasn't because I was not a good credit risk and because I wasn't paying my bills. It was because they decided they just arbitrarily wanted to reduce my ability to access credit. And so they proactively or preemptively prevented me from borrowing. And they cut off all my credit lines and now I became illiquid. And it was a big, big, big problem for me. So I'm not a fan of relying upon credit lines for any form of liquidity. So let's address Mahin's concern of where could you store this wealth where it'd be easy to deploy and safe? Yeah, so the third part now is what are your alternatives? So if, if you're willing to be in dollars, but you don't want to be in the bank, so we know a lot of people that 
buy paid up annuities with life insurance companies. It's still denominated in dollars. You still have counterparty risk, but the responsibility is now no longer on the FDIC or the government, it's on the life insurance. So, you know, I'm not advocating that, but I'm just saying we know people that do that. That is one way to do it. Another way to do it, and again, I'm not going to advocate for this, but people are doing this, is they park their money in something like cryptocurrency, right? It's highly liquid. They can convert it into any currency. And so people call that like, you know, digital gold. I, I have some different opinions on it, although, you know, some people will say, hey, Russ, you blew it because you didn't invest in cryptocurrency when it was super cheap and you could have made all that money on speculation. I'm not a speculator. I was a speculator once in my life. I paid a big price for that. And so, yes, part of my conservatism cost me the opportunity to ride a hot trend like that. I would miss out on tulip mania. I would miss out on pet rock. I would miss out on uh, cabbage patch dolls. I would miss out on all those things because that's just a game I don't play. So now, you're telling me no Dogecoin for you. Yeah, that's just not my thing. But I do consider precious metals to be a bit of a way to step outside of the currency system to avoid counterparty risk, to hold my equity on my balance sheet in a real asset that is under my control that I can convert into any currency anytime highly liquid. Now I do have some friction, meaning that, you know, there's a bid and an ask. And I, I, when I buy, I pay a premium. And when I sell, I take a discount. With that said, if the dollar is actually falling, and of course you can look at the track record of silver and gold over the last 10, 20 years, uh, it's not a bad place to hold some liquidity. And here's the thing, unlike equity and real estate, I can borrow against my precious metals. So if I'm holding a bunch of precious metals in a depository, I can borrow against that to get the liquidity I need without losing the upside of the gold, without having to suffer that friction and without having to qualify for the loan. So if I'm parking my liquidity in a piece of property in equity, and I'm counting on available credits or lines of credit to access that, to have liquidity, the challenge that I've got is that I have to qualify and the lending has to be available. And I would argue the pricing is probably quite a bit more volatile. Real estate goes up, real estate goes down. Whereas precious metals, not that it doesn't change denominated in dollars, but it's got a pretty good track record of being stable. And again, it's like a home-based pivot point where you can pivot into any currency. So if you decide to transact in euros or yuan or yen, whatever currency you choose, dollars, you can, you can pivot because there's always a bid in any currency for precious metals. Precious metals is a tool that I think a lot of people don't really understand. And I've become very enamored of it the last you know, 10 years or so after the 2008 crisis, realizing the role it can play and how it has responded to the varying economic circumstances we've had. So I encourage you to take a look at that as an option, as a place to store some liquid wealth while you're waiting for the next best opportunity. In fact, Russ is working on an awesome YouTube series called Precious Equity to really delve into this. We had a sneak peek at the Investor Summit this year and it was extremely well received. If you want to be on the list for that, just send an email to Precious Equity at realestateguysradio.com. Give you one more thought, Maheen, and if your concern is about U.S. banks and a bail-in and the U.S. dollar, there's one other potential way to keep U.S. dollars a little more safe, and those are foreign banks that don't have fractional reserve banking. So there are a number of banks around the world that will allow you to have an account in U.S. dollars, and they do nothing with the dollars except keep them there. As you can imagine, because they're not lending out the money and making money from arbitrage, the fees are higher to have those kinds of accounts, but it is a way to diversify where you hold your capital. It's Ask the Guys, your questions, our answers. More when we come back, you're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. If you're among the millions of people who've recently purchased a firearm, but you've never been professionally trained, this is your chance to get four full days of world-class professional training for free. Owning a gun is a personal choice and is a serious responsibility. We're firearms training advocates, and we believe the safest gun owners are those properly trained in the safe, responsible handling of their firearm. And if you own a gun for personal defense, a life or death situation is not the time to discover your skills under pressure or lacking. For a limited time, we're offering a four-day defensive handgun training course at the premier firearms training school in the country, a $2,000 value for free. 
You pay only for your ammo and a $50 background check fee. This course has helped thousands of students go from nervous beginner to skilled marksman on par with law enforcement and military in just four days. To claim your free firearms training course, simply send your email request to gunsafety at realestateguysradio.com. That's gunsafety at realestateguysradio.com. Terms and conditions apply. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than one billion dollars don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team raise capital find deals and make full-time money in six months or less go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events all the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk optimize profits and earn big money you can too go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events Hi, this is Kim Kiyosaki. I'm the author of Rich Woman, and you are listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Now in our 25th year of broadcast, it's Ask the Guys Your Questions, Our Answers. This next question comes from Kyle in Boise, Idaho. Hi there. I've been listening to your show for quite some time now. I had heard a while back an episode on timberland investing, particularly in teak. I wanted to re-listen to that episode, but I can't seem to find it. Hope you can let me somehow know since I'm very eager to dive in. Thank you very much. Well, Kyle, three things. First of all, if you go to realestateguysradio.com and just search for the word teak, you're going to find shows, you're going to find all kinds of cool stuff, or you can simply send an email to teak at realestateguysradio.com and you get an awesome report on what that investment is like. Or number three, and my favorite, is let's say hi to Rachel Jensen from ECI. Hey! <laughs> Hello, Robert. It's so fancy running into you here. <laughs> How about that? It's our special guest. I said, you know, I bet I can track down this woman and we'll get an answer. So people are interested in investing and lots of stuff, but Teak is fascinating. Every time we do our Belize Discovery Trip, we always come by and see you, and you certainly talk about what you do in Belize, but I always ask you to spend those extra few minutes to talk about teak. Tell us what all the excitement's about. Yes. Well, Kyle, just so you know, the teak trees are continuing to grow regardless of what happened over the last year, year and a half. The trees are continuing to grow. So I don't know when you heard the podcast initially. I think it was, Robert, what, four years ago? Five years ago, maybe even that we initially talked about it. But teak trees and ownership of timber is still one of the most important ways that you can diversify your holdings, your, your portfolio into another asset class, into another another country. For those of you who are not familiar with teak, teak is a hardwood. It's used in a lot of luxury construction. It's also used in a lot of boating, a lot of outdoor furniture because it can withstand the elements. It's a hard wood. So for this hard wood to grow, it takes about 25 years, which I hope you on the other side of the line aren't really getting nervous about hearing that. I know a lot of people who listen to the real estate guys are used to your monthly checks coming in or your weekly checks if it's a vacation property. But with timber, think of it like a long-term hold long-term investment. You hold on to it. It's for you. It's for your kids. It's for your great grandkids and your grandkids can't forget them. And if you don't have any kids or or anyone along those lines, you can just hold on to it for yourself or pass it on to heirs down the line. So Timberland ownership is nothing new. It's not something we invented. We just made it more accessible for that average investor, the person that doesn't necessarily have hundreds of millions to spend in one investment. You know, some investments pay monthly, some quarterly, some annually. This one happens to pay every 25 years. And there's some other things through thinnings and the like. But the bottom line is, you know, a methodology for investing for lots of years is land banking. I buy a piece of land and what I think will be the path of progress. And maybe in 10 or 20 or 50 years, it's worth something. Well, this is kind of like that and that you actually own the real estate, but something grows on it. And in this case, it's, and I'm glad you brought this up, it's a wood that is in high demand. And no matter what happens in the economy, no matter what happens in the elections, no matter what happens in pandemics, it grows. Yes, it does. And we we did see that from the recession 2008 to 2012. We had our farm manager out there every year just putting the tape measure around the same tree, letting us know that it grew. And then, of course, during this last uh, this last year, it still continued to grow. And we had one of our owners who was a, a little sassy guy. And he's like, all right, did you have to put masks around the trees for them to continue to grow and live out there? But, of course, we didn't have to do that. They, they can 
continued to grow with the elements. So it's neat though with timber too and antique specifically because it's been in the marketplace for a while. It's not just something that we created in a lab or discovered a year or two or three ago. It's been around for centuries. It was used on the Titanic. Some of uh, the flooring was actually Titanic in addition to some of the furniture and uh, the boat was was made out of teak wood. So we, we've seen, we've done a ton of research on this and Robert mentioned um, some of the white papers and the resource guides that we have. We have done a tremendous amount of studies on the use of teak, who is using it in the marketplace and what the values are currently, what we expect them to look like in the future, what they've looked like historically. So use that email address that Robert mentioned there if you want any of those white papers. Absolutely. Just send an email to teak at realestateguysradio.com and you get that report. Thanks, Rachel, and good to see you. Yes, and thank you, uh, Kyle, for dialing in and asking about the latest updates. Well, we could go on and on because we've got lots of amazing questions from our awesome listeners, but that's about the end of our time today. If we didn't get to your question, just send it to us via email at ask at realestateguysradio.com. Ask at realestateguysradio.com. In eight or ten weeks, we'll have another edition of Ask the Guys. Coming up in just a few short weeks, we'll be opening up registration for the 20th Annual Investor Summit. And you can get on the advance notice list by sending an email to summit2022. That's summit2022 at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks to all the listeners that submitted questions. If we didn't get to yours, maybe next time. Until then, go out and make some equity happen. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Paradigm Life. Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at beyourbank.com. Mid-South Home Buyers, low-cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. Find these and other great companies under the Resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.